as we have discussed in the changing perspective of business ethics management where the organizations are responsible for managing the uh, social problems more focused towards managing the social problems this can be subdivided into three steps setting up the standards or the code of ethics second is dealing with the stakeholders properly and third with the assessment of the uh, things done of the processes followed and of course fourth is formal and informal ways of managing the uh, business ethics processes uh, through different programs because if you go back to the definition of business ethics management it consists of policies practices and programs which are formally uh, or informally like given directly by the organization as a voluntary approach to see that the things are done in a proper way in morally right way throughout the organization in the la last discussion we discussed about setting of particular standards that is the code of ethics which guides how the organization is going to function in the global code of ethics also we saw like though there, there are differences in some time of the interpretation of what is right and what is wrong we have tried to arrive at certain basic things which needs to be uh, followed by all the organizations and this is in agreement we find like respecting human values is the core values respecting the total tradi uh, local traditions and also the understanding that it is a contextual factor of right and wrong are the three main consensus which has come to and also in when you talking of respecting the core values we find like there have been different efforts to find out these core values and mostly agreed upon values like there have been uh, studies uh, there have been an effort which talks of the like um, interfaith declaration interfaith declaration of the taking different religion orientation into consideration which has found like justice mutual respect honesty and stewardship are the main values which are to be nurtured across because this is generally acceptable by all faiths in the cox table round table uh, we found like shared prosperity then justice and civic responsibility are some of the mm, core things guide values which have been accepted in the un global compact nine principles have been arrived at which are universally accepted by most and these covers the nine principles are classified under four broad headings which talks of respecting the human rights respecting the the labor and associated principles with regard to it respecting the environment and what are the steps taken by the organization in order to deal with the environment and also with the anti corruption steps for anti corruption so the difference of these mm, even global compact with the other mm, areas or the other uh, codes that have been arrived at is it is 
it has taken into consideration also one of the primary stakeholders which is the um, environment. I, if you see into the different codes of ethics written for different organization, it is mainly focused towards how the employees are going to behave within a particular organization given the values of the organization, the norms of the organization and expectations of the organization, what it like wants to do and how it want to deliver its goods and services. But as we understand the, the scope of business ethics management is increasing. So, we know it is not enough to have a code of ethics which focuses towards only the role of employees within the organization, but this code of ethics of how the business is going to deal with other stakeholders also is very important, a glimpse of which has been shown in this UN Global Compact. For this, we have to understand who are our stakeholders and how we manage the stakeholder relationship. In our previous discussion of stakeholder theory in the last few modules, we discussed like stakeholders are individuals or groups who either affects or gets affected by the way that we do the business or by the products and services which gets which is the output of the business. And the aim of the business should be to provide less of harm and more of benefit to the stakeholders and not to violate but to respect the rights of the stakeholders. With this, we, this is the normative theory of the stakeholder. There are descriptive theories of stakeholders also, which talks of how actually the business houses like interact with the different stakeholders and how they take into consideration their different needs based on the importance that they feel like they were having for their business. And instrumental theory of stakeholder, it talks of like the mutual interactions between the mm, stakeholder and the firm and what is beneficial to both of them. Here, we will have to understand like always it is not possible as stated in the normative theory to see to it that the needs of all the stakeholders are addressed equally well at a certain point of time. And in many cases, it is required to prioritize amongst the stakeholders. If the stakeholders are more than what I can deal with at a present time based on my resource constraints that I may be having. So, it is required on the part of the organization to set some priorities based on which it is going to choose a set of stakeholders whose demands and needs it is going to like answer to. So, let us find out how this prioritization is being done. This perspective is called the instrumental perspective. So, this is also called stakeholder impact analysis which helps the organization to identify the stakeholder who is more crucial to its survival and to make sure that the satisfaction of their need is paramount. 
earlier the, on the basis of this the two three stakeholders who were like whom the organization thought to be of importance are the shareholders the employees and the customers but now with the changing nature of the models with the understanding of the networking of the stakeholders other stakeholders have also been included within this like to understand who are its who are crucial to its survival so three important um, attributes which are which determine the perceived importance or salience of the stakeholders are first is the power of the stakeholder second is the legitimacy of the stakeholder and third is the urgency so what is the power shown by the stakeholder what is the power with um, of the stakeholder in terms of their um, whether they are linked to other influential stakeholders or not which me affect their um, the firms functioning directly so it talks of the political power maybe backing through political power the or the power to um, move start mass movement all these things will determine whether that stakeholder is powerful enough or not and whether that power is detrimental to the functioning of the organization so what is the power um, dynamics between the uh, stakeholder and the firm if it sees like it is very powerful entity not by itself maybe or by itself if not by itself by the uh, connections the networkings it may be having so that collective strength is more then it it is recognized as powerful legitimacy is how much legitimate is the claim of the stakeholder that it is a stakeholder who is directly connected with the nature of the business or the the how the business is getting done is affecting the um, uh, stakeholder so the legitimacy of the stakeholder also needs to be mm, like um, judged and urgency how important is their demand how truly it is linked with the mm, business processes that is being done what is the allowable time for the harm to occur like if corrective measures are not taken now we cannot arrest the harm produced by the business activities on the stakeholders so what is the urgency so these three things power legitimacy and urgency determines which are the stakeholders on like single or the groups who get selected be become as my salient stakeholders and the firm needs to focus on them and address to their problems this is called the instrumental perspective so we can understand a firm has a two way relationship with the uh, stakeholder let us see what are the different types of relationship that the firm shares with the different stakeholders we find here listed are few types of relationships like challenge sparing partners one we support mutual support endorsement project dialogue strategy dialogue task force joint venture or alliance 
if we move from top down we find there is a shift from the stakeholders being in a conflicting relationship with the firm to being in a collaborative relationship with the firm. So, when you are talking of challenge it is the stakeholders role is to challenge the business activities and processes. From sparing partners means they agree to come to terms together, but sometimes there are heavy conflicts between the um, organizations and they need to address these conflicts. One way support is where the firm is supporting the um, stakeholder to do some of its activities for what it is being formed. Mutual support is where both the firm and the stakeholder are supporting each other to reach some of its activities or objectives. Endorsement is where the there is a paid or unpaid approval of the organ firm to some of the stakeholders and they represent the cause of the um, firm. Project dialogue where the firm enters into some type of dialogue with the stakeholders to do some joint projects. Strategy dialogue is where the organization starts picking up with the um, stakeholders, so the some strategy level decisions can be taken for a long term. Task force is where for a small work at hand the stakeholders, relevant stakeholders and the firm come together to form a team to address the social issue at hand. Joint venture or alliance is where the organization comes to follow up, start follows a partnership to jointly address a certain social issue and do some um, find out certain ways of how to mutually function together to deal with the social issue at hand. So, these are the different types of relationship that the organization may be having with the stakeholders. However, as we see a move from the conflicting type of relationship to the collaborative type of relationship uh, may be good in the sense like a collaboration between the um, two bodies of the firm and the stakeholders help the firm in reaching the social objectives. But however, this collaboration may have some negative impact also. Let us see what are these negative impacts of firm stakeholder collaboration. The problems is then first is resource intensity. If the collaboration of the firm happens with the number of stakeholders then it is a huge complex activity to be done and the resource may become a problem of how do we give resources for like executing these many number of projects altogether. Culture clash is where the 
two different stakeholders may belong to two different cultures and because it is required to collaborate we are doing so but inherently the belief systems are different and these may lead to culture clash because both of the cultures are not matching with each other. When the schizophrenia this phenomena is corporates have multiple identity they are doing n number of functions together. So, if two organizations are equally like widespread and it has multiple objectives, it may so happen for one of the objectives they are collaborating with each other, but for a different objective they are fighting with each other, are in conflict with each other. So, it sometimes leads to a feeling of what is the actual relationship of the firm with the another stakeholder. Is it like that of a, uh, are, are, they, are, are they in conflict or collaboration? These type of multiple um, identity and mixed identity may give rise to a feeling of schizophrenia uncontrollability because there are so many stakeholders and if the organization enters into uh, coop, like cooperative relationship collaborative relationship with all the stakeholders so there are different uh, projects going on different uh, people are there of working together so and it really becomes difficult to manage all things uh, together. Co-optation by this process of um, increasing into partnership with the other um, with the other stakeholders, if the stakeholder um, from the stakeholders viewpoint it may be like getting more molded in the terms of what organization is trying to um, uh, see in that uh, or uh, is going to uh, sponsor for or to promote for and these will um, after a certain point of time it so happens that the stakeholder is speaking the voice of the uh, firm itself and so individuality is getting lost. This is more particular with case of like NGOs or uh, entering or civic society organizations, um, civil society organizations forming a partnership with the firm because maybe CSOs are formed mainly with the objective of voicing up the voice of the society or the stakeholders who cannot speak for themselves and act as a mirror towards the organization to show them what they have taken care of and what they have they are neglecting. But if they enter into a joint partnership with the organization, they are sometimes may develop some obligation and that will be talking more in accountability, then uh, they lose their own objective and start speaking what the firm propagates that it wants to do. So, these type of things like in order to get enter into the partnership for the sponsorship money or other things over there. The firm, the um, NGOs may try to orient themselves in the way like they get the partnership done, established, but in the process they lose their individuality and may shift from the purpose for which it was born like speaking for the 
voice of the stakeholder who is underrepresented, whose needs are underrepresented in the corporate's consideration of distributing uh, benefits. Uh, or it is mostly harmed by the um, organization's processes, but there is no damage control taken for it. So, this independence nature of decision making may be lost while you are entering into partnership with the corporate. Next is when you are talking of accountability, maybe by entering into a partnership with the stakeholder, the firm is achieving its accountability towards the different stakeholders. But when it comes to the accountability of the stakeholder per se, suppose for the civil society organization, NGO, so etcetera, who are accountable mainly to the society at large, but here the accountability may shift to because they are taking donations or entering into partnerships with the organization whose activities if they were not involved in this partnership would may have been um, monitoring and reporting and evaluating and criticizing whatever. So, because of this mutual collaboration, they, they be like sort of start supporting their objectives and lose their and get disconnected from their accountability towards the get disconnected from the accountability towards the um, main um, chunk of the society for which they were representing, for, for whose uh, to represent whose needs they were mainly formed. So, due to these factors, again there could be resistance from the society at large for the partnership, the collaboration to develop between different stakeholders and the firm, because they want to them to be maintained in a uh, independent um, way, so that the fairness of the process is maintained. Next when you are talking of the fairness of the processes, when you are talking of the collaboration and how far it is um, accepted, not accepted by the organization and the society at large, how much it is okay for the organization and uh, maybe civic society or civil society organizations, NGOs to enter into partnership, to whom we should enter into partnership and to what extent. All these we will be discussing in details while we are discussing the role of business ethics with different stakeholders per se. Here we are focusing into the when you are talking in these terms like how far it is acceptable, uh, whether it is ok or not actually we are focusing towards assessing the ethical performance, like to find out how far the performance has been effective or not, and what are the processes followed or not, whether these are ok or not, and this will be the discussion of your next module. Thank you.